A reading from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Lila, Chapter 3. Lord Chaitanya at the house of Advaita Acharya. This is a continuation of this chapter. So, this is 127 on the board. And it starts from what verse? 114, right? To 127, I think. So, we'll go back to verse 115. If you can remember from the previous week, we spoke about this prayer that was given by, uh, or sung by, Advaita Charya in glorification of Lord Chaitanya. And it was a song, a prayer sung by Srimati Radharani. And now the verses continue. Advaita Charya led the Sankirtan party with great pleasure. He sang this verse. There was a manifestation of ecstatic perspiration, shivering, raised hairs, tears in the eyes, and sometimes thundering and bellowing. I'll read the verse from the previous verse. My dear friends, what shall I say? Today I have received the highest transcendental pleasure. After many, many days, Lord Krishna is in my home. Verse 116. While dancing... Advaita Charya would sometimes turn around and around and catch the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Advaita Charya would then speak to him as follows. Sri Advaita Charya would say, Many days you escaped me by bluffing, but now I have you in my home and I will keep you bound up. Hmm. So speaking, Advaita Charya performed congregational chanting with great pleasure for three hours that night and danced all the time. When the Dvaita Acharya danced in that way, Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya felt ecstatic love for Krishna. And because of his separation, the waves and flames of love increased. Being agitated by the ecstasy, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu suddenly fell to the ground. Seeing this, the Dvaita Acharya stopped dancing. When Mukunda saw the ecstasy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he understood the feelings of the Lord and began to sing many stanzas, augmenting the force of the Lord's ecstasy. Advaita Charya raised the body of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to help him dance, but the Lord, after hearing the stanzas sung by Mukunda, could not be held due to his bodily symptoms. Tears fell from his eyes and his whole body trembled. His body hair stood on end. His, he perspired heavily and, and his words faltered. Sometimes he stood up and sometimes he fell and sometimes he cried. Hmm. Where am I? Okay. <laughs> Mukunda said, My dear intimate friend, what has not happened to me? Due to the effects of poison of love for Krishna, my body and mind have been severely afflicted. It's a poison. If you get love for God, you're dead <laughs> materially. <laughs> so it's poison. When Mukunda saw Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was feeling ecstatic pain and manifesting ecstatic bodily symptoms, all due to feelings of separation from Krishna, he sang songs about meeting with Krishna. Then Advaita Charya stopped dancing. Verse number 125. My feeling is like this. My mind burns day and night and I can get no rest. If there were some place I could go to meet Krishna, I would immediately fly there. This stanza was sung by Mukunda in a very sweet voice. But as soon as Sri Chaitanya heard the stanza, his mind went to pieces. The transcendental ecstatic symptoms of disappointment, moroseness, pleasure, restlessness, pride, and humility all began to fight like soldiers within the Lord. So all these ecstatic symptoms, were con they're contrary. Some of them are contrary to each other, and so they were fighting each other in the ecstasy of attacking Lord Chaitanya's body. So he's going through this. Transcendental pain. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Harsa is described in the Bhakti Rasamatu Sindhu. Harsa is experienced when one finally attains the desired goal of life 
and consequently becomes very glad. When harsa is present, the body shivers and one's bodily hairs stand on end. There are perspiration, tears, and an outburst, outburst of passion and madness. The mouth becomes swollen and one experiences inertia and illusion. Sounds like you need a doctor. <laughs> Different kind of doctor. When a person attains his desired object and feels very fortunate, the luster of his body increases. Because of his own qualities and feelings of greatness, he does not care for anyone else. And this is called garva, or pride. In this condition, one utters prayers and does not reply to others' inquiries. Looking at one's own body, concealing one's desires, and not heeding the words of others are symptoms visible in the ecstasy of garva. End of purport. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kidam Mayam Dadanti Swampadanti Kam Vande Hum Shigaro Shri Yutapa de Kamalam Shigarun Vaishnavam Scha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahaganat Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Deva Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitam Scha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Brindavane Swari Vrishabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pyevacha Pavane Pyo Vaishnave Pyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadad Har Sivasadi Gor Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare mm. So we're hearing about ecstatic symptoms of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and what are the results of such symptoms? Restlessness, disappointment, moroseness, pride, humility, and transcendental pleasure. It's quite difficult to understand these things unless you can actually experience them. And that is the process of bhakti. The process of bhakti is a process of nine stages. Adhavsrata, sarusanga, bhajana kriya, anartanivritti, nishta, ruchi, ashakti, bhava, and ultimately prema. Rupa Goswami describes the process of pure devotional service in these nine stages. And each of these stages has a particular characteristic that one may be experiencing and exhibiting, which is indicated on the stage that one is practicing devotional service on. Here we're hearing at a very advanced stage of bhakti. And of course, this is Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he is... Krishna himself in the mood of Srimati Radharani's ecstasy for himself. And so these these symptoms cannot be imitated or even understood or explained. They can only be experienced. But we understand that in devotional service, we see sometimes even devotees in a lower stage of bhakti may exhibit some of these symptoms. They come and go. They not necessarily become constant. When they become constant, then they become they become fixed on a certain level of devotional love for Krishna. Before then, even in kirtan or in an experience in some aspect of devotional service, devotees can experience ecstasy. And these ecstasies are Krishna's special mercy upon the devotee. In order for the devotee 
to somehow or other Krishna to reciprocate his love for his devotee. Because pure devotional service can be attained in one second. Or it cannot be attained after millions of lifetimes. It's a state of consciousness. And sometimes when everything is in the right place, when one's consciousness is there, the atmosphere is there, the environment is conducive, one experiences ecstasy. And that ecstasy, one gets an understanding, yes, this is actually Krishna consciousness. Because what are these ecstasies indicating of that one is no longer, what we say, attached to finding ecstasies in the material world. What are the ecstasies in the material world? What is material happiness? Material happiness is just a relief from material suffering. It has no substance on its own. Because material happiness and material suffering are pretty much the same thing, two sides of the same coin. They're all based on the external environment and the contact with the senses and the objects. And therefore, they're temporary and cannot fulfill one's desires for pleasure. And so when a devotee may experience this happiness in devotional service through the ecstasy of devotional service, they feel, yes, now I, uh, now I become, uh, now I can understand what devotional service is about. And we experience ecstasies many times in smaller portions. Just like sometimes you feel so happy, just so happy. And everyone around you looks the same way, even though they're not. Because <laughs> that's the nature of happiness. When you're happy, everyone looks the same way. <laughs> and if you're miserable, it's like that also. <laughs> Generally, that's a general statement. It's not an absolute principle, but that's how the nature of consciousness reflects the the, rea the environment of ar around us. So when devotees feel very happy, and that is the process of Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada said, if you're not feeling happy, you're in maya. <laughs> he says, if you're not feeling happy, you're in maya. And one time, one very senior devotee, Srila Prabhupada, he's a sannyasi, very senior, very intimate associate of Srila Prabhupada. He said to Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, I'm in Maya. Prabhupada said, you're always in Maya. <laughs> when he heard that, he hit the ground full force and did complete dandavats. Because <laughs> he understood Prabhupada told him the truth. If we knew what actually transcendental happiness is in devotional service, then we could understand a little bit of what this process is about. And it's available through the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. But we have to purify our heart. And therefore, these nine stages of bhakti give us an indication of the different characteristics we may be exhibiting and practicing to see where we are and what is the next stage. The stage of Anartha Nivritti, that's the stage of where these elements of the material energy due to our association from time of memorial has caused us to not to, uh, not to experience happiness in devotional service. And these Anarthas, Anartha means something that we don't want. Artha means auspicious and Anartha means that which is unwanted or inauspicious. And but Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur says there are 16 anarthas, four categories of four. Anarthas simply come by way of not understanding the proper philosophical knowledge given to us by the spiritual master. Jai Sri Sri Radha Gokula Nanda Ki Jai. Sita Ram Lakshman Hanumanji Ki Jai Gaur Nittai Ki Jai. And there are anarthas. Here's where devotees get stuck. They get, they like this anartha, <laughs> and that is the anartha that comes by material happiness. If I can be happy in my material life, that's good. 
But that's an anartha because material happiness diverts one's attentions away from gaining real transcendental happiness. And therefore, even though material happiness may come by way of circumstance, still one should not aspire for material happiness. And what are some of the symptoms of material happiness? Going to the heavenly planets, Swargaloka, becoming an associate of the demigods and the demigoddesses who enjoy way beyond this material world. This is a big anartha, especially for those who have been born in India, because it's preached many by many great saintly persons that one has to elevate themselves to higher realms of material enjoyment through the process of performing pious activities, doing pujas, performing austerities, and chanting mantras, then one can attain a higher consciousness and elevate oneself after death to the to the realm of demigods where there's hardly any suffering materially. And people live, Prabhupada says they live for ten thousands of years. Pretty good, huh? They don't get sick, no doctors. They have, you know, they have mystic power, many of them. The, Prabhupada says the, the women in the heavenly planets would make the women on this planet look like horses. <laughs> so I'm sorry if that was not appropriate, but <laughs> I'm just quoting Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> so there's such beautiful women there. And beautiful men also, for those ladies also. And so, there's so much opulence and grandeur and pleasure in the heavenly planets. So one might think, yeah, why not? Even if I have to take another birth, it's not so bad. The higher realms, Svargaloka. But that's an anartha that stops one from actually becoming determined on the platform of devotional service. Mystic power. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the 11th canto, Krishna personally goes through describing the 18 forms of mystic power. There are eight primary mystic powers, becoming smaller than the smaller, becoming larger than the largest, becoming, uh, what we say, lighter than the lightest having the power to get anything from anywhere. A lot of yogis, when they come to the Western countries to preach their philosophy, they have this called Prapti City. And they can simply, simply by meditation, they can bring an object to wherever they are from any other place in the world. Prabhupada tells that when he was a young boy, Many yogis would come and stay with his father, and his father would provide them for what they, whatever they needed. And he was telling how one yogi, he said to his father, ask anything. And his father said, get me some pomegranates from Kavu. He said, go into the next room. So he went into, his father went into the next room, there's a pomegranate branch laying on the table with pomegranates on it. Yeah, they must. They can do anything. It's just like so many things. There's that one yogi. I won't mention his name. He used to make go like this, and then he would have gold, and he could make ashes. Of course, nobody wants ashes, but but they can speak in such a way that to control your minds, they can say anything, and you'll believe it. That's the power of some of these yogis. So powerful. And these are, there's eight eight powerful mystic. You can become you. There's even one you can create your own planet. Yeah, this Vishwamitra Muni had the power. He made a man take birth from a coconut tree. That would save a lot of problems, especially for the ladies. <laughs> He could do that. He, he made a person come out of a coconut tree. And that was the, that's how that person was born. Yogis can completely defy the laws of material nature and do all kinds of magic. And of course, when people see that, they think, oh, wow, this is God. And he says, I'm God, too. And they believe it until he has to go to the dentist. And that's another... <laughs> so... 
Yeah, so this 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 mystic power, Krishna or Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains, is also an anartha. And Krishna, after describing the whole eighteen uh, mystic powers, he says, "You don't need them." <laughs> He goes in detail, and then there's purports on each of the verses. Krishna is explaining them. Krishna is speaking to Uddhava personally, explaining these mystic power. At the end, he says, they're simply with moderation. <laughs> and people aspire for such things, right? So that's a, that's a powerful, that's a powerful anartha, to have mystic power. And if you're a devotee, you have mystic power automatically. Why? Because the devotee takes shelter of Yogeshwar and Krishna is the master of all mystics. So the devotee has all mystic power at his hands, but he doesn't use it. He doesn't use it. Why? Because he doesn't, he knows, or she knows, it's just a botheration, that's all. And if I need it for some service, then I can use it. We've seen how Prabhupada used his mystic power many times. Sometimes it was one time Prabhupada was doing RT, and he was standing next to, he was doing RT to his Guru Maharaj. It was Guru Puja, and uh, he was offering the water, and then he looked around to pour it into the cup after each of the, you know, but there was no cup. So Prabhupada saw a Tulsi plant just across the way. He took the cup and went. Choo! And there was a stream of water that went up, over, and went right on Tulsi, and not a drop hit the ground. <laughs> and then, then you, Prabhupada just did it like, you know, it's just like what I do, you know. So he just kept going and offering the RT. Everybody else was shocked. <laughs> Prabhupada just said, you know, it was, it was, you know, it was necessary. <laughs> when, when the altar, the devotees had built this altar with big, heavy pillars and big beams across. And they were about to do a, a, what was it, an installation ceremony of the deities. The deities were already on the altar and they were about to do it. The altar started to crumble and shake. The pillars started to move and the top pillar started to fall. Prabhupada was in the front row. He got up and he ran and with his self and he held that pillar up until the devotees came. It took two men to carry that pillar. And Prabhupada held it up until the devotees came and helped him. And Prabhupada had limited, unlimited strength. So he showed, you know, how a devotee, you know, has all... Prabhupada even says it many times in, in his lectures. Devotees have full mystic powers, but they don't use it. If you need it, you'll get it. Krishna will give it to you on the spot if you need it. But don't use it, please, because it, we don't want to show off. <laughs> it's not about showing off. It's available if you're engaged in devotional service. But these things, if one becomes attracted to it or attached to them, and thinking that these things are something that I need, that's an anartha. So I have 16 anarthas. And of course, the most dangerous are anarthas and the ones that block our progress in devotional service are offenses. Offenses to the Lord, offenses to the Holy Name, offenses to the Vaishnavas, and offenses to people in general. So these are the four categories of offenses, and these are the hardest ones to get over. But as we make progress in devotional service and become reach the stage of nishta, nishta means fixed. What does nishta actually mean? Sometimes it's described that nishta means while I'm steady, every day I chant my rounds, every day I read the Bhagavatam, every day I do my service, in other words. And a person may be defined as being in the stage of nishta, but that is not real nishta. Real nishta means steady in bhakti. Steady in loving Krishna, offering one's devotion to Krishna. When one becomes steady in that, that is actually nishta. And it manifests itself in different symptoms, where a devotee becomes fixed in their service also. But becoming fixed in the service without becoming fixed in bhakti is not really the platform of nishta, although it may look like it. Real nishta is to always be in the mood of offering our devotion to Krishna in whatever service we are engaged in. 
And then, after one becomes, reaches the stage of nishta, they reach ruchi. What is that verse from the Bhagavad Gita? Uh, Prasanatmana soshati na kankshati sama sarveshu bhuteshu labhakti prabhat Yeah, that's it. And that verse is on the platform of ruchi. A devotee doesn't lament about and he lost. Oh, okay. I lost this. And the devotee doesn't lament about not getting something. Something, I want something, I didn't get it. Okay, I wasn't supposed to have it. I tried. I lost this. All right, I go on somehow. Loss and gain are seem, seem the same as a devotee on that platform of Ruchi. And they're happy. They're joyful. They're looking, they feel pleasure within in the process of the... That's the platform of Ruchi. We haven't even come to the ecstatic symptoms yet. That's on the higher levels yet. And that is on the platform of Ashakti, which is the next stage, when one becomes very attached to Krishna. What are some of the symptoms? Fully engaged in devotional service. If they waste one minute, they feel unhappy. If someone wastes their time, they get angry at that person. <laughs> or they become disturbed by that. That's a symptom of uh, ashakti. Not a moment wasted in devotional service. And, that's, and of course, there's many other symptoms on that platform. There's nine symptoms on the stage of bhava or ashakti, and then bhava, and then ultimately prema. These symptoms here are not ordinary ecstatic symptoms. The basic ecstatic symptoms are standing on hands, hairs on the end. Devotees even experience that too. In kirtan, sometimes if you look, you'll see your hairs are up <laughs> like that. One girl was telling me I was giving a class in Slovenia. This was many years ago. And she said, I was in my room and I was chanting Hare Krishna and I was all alone. And then as I was looking at and I saw all my hairs on my arms were standing straight up. And then I was thinking, that, boy, I must have ecstatic symptoms. But I realized the room was cold and I was... For... <laughs> so it wasn't exactly... <laughs> so you have to distinguish between material conditions and real ecstatic symptoms like that. And so these symptoms are part of the process of evolution and the process of devotional service. But we can't imitate them. And sometimes you see there's a class of people who try to imitate these symptoms. Rolling on the ground, crying. There's a group of, I don't know what they call them, spiritualists. They eat chilies so they cry. <laughs> And they have, they call them chili babas, you know. <laughs> so they eat all these chilies and then they're experiencing this crying. But it, and everybody thinks, oh boy, they're in ecstasy. But then, not like that. <laughs> so you see, you know, there's, there are people who imitate them. When Prabhupada was in Vrindavan, Prabhupada was sitting with a few devotees in his room and one man somehow or other came into Prabhupada's room. He was a local local person. He saw Prabhupada, he started chanting something and then he fell to the ground and started rolling all, all on the ground. And the devotee with, with Prabhupada was thinking, wow, this man's got ecstatic symptoms. Prabhupada under, could understand differently. He said, go kick him. <laughs> So the boy, the devotee, you know, he hesitated at first. Pope said, go kick him. So he kicked him, and when he kicked him, the guy got up and ran out. <laughs> That's the end of the ecstatic symptom. <laughs> so there are a class of people who like to exhibit these things in order to attract attention, or maybe even convince themselves that they're spiritually advanced, like that. But these symptoms happen naturally. And not simply can, can be, they can be induced by a certain environment or a certain situation, but they're not done what we say. They're not, you can't plan them like that. Like that. And Prabhupada, when he would get ecstatic symptoms, he would sometimes reject them. 
For two reasons he would check them. One, because it would interfere with his devotional service. Because the, just like we hear from, from the scriptures, how Sukadev Goswami, when he was narrating Srimad Bhagavatam to, to Maharaj Pariksit, he didn't mention the name of Srimati Radharani. He is an intimate associate of Srimati Radharani. So therefore, in order to avoid the ecstasy of remembering and speaking Radharani's name, he didn't. He gives a little indication by mentioning one verse, Aradhanam Sarvesham. He says that person who has the topmost devotion, Aradhanam, he doesn't say her name just without that prefix and ending. And therefore, it is explained that if he would have started speaking about Radharani, there would have been no completion of his uh, to, you know, service to speak Srimad Bhagavatam to Maharaj Pariksha. So he avoided that. So great souls, they avoid the symptoms of ecstasy in order to do their service. And at the same time, not to make a show. Because a lot of people will like to imitate that. They will like to imitate that, thinking that, oh, well, this is how you do it. And therefore, it can be done. But here you see, Mukunda was singing so sweetly, and Lord Chaitanya went into ecstasy. And then, the ecstasy was so so much that he, his mind simply went to pieces. When you read Chaitanya Charitamrita, especially in the Anchalila, you see how Lord Chaitanya went into such deep feelings of ecstasy that it was impossible for his followers to actually keep him under control. When he was in the Gambira room, uh, he would he would go into deep ecstasy. Sarup Damodar Goswami and Ramananda Roy would read the poetry and the the philosophy of 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 um, Vidyapati and Jayadev Goswami from Gita Govinda and Lord Chaitanya would go into these ecstasies and he would go mad. Sometimes he would go unconscious for like hours and then he would come out and say, "Where am I?" I was just in Vrindavan. Now I'm here. How'd you? Why did you bring me here? So these ecstasies of Lord Chaitanya are just to, uh, for us to understand that this is the higher stages of bhakti, which is also available to devotees. But we cannot imitate them. But we can appreciate these things. And simply when we dance in kirtan, just like it says here, how did these ecstasies come? It was Kirtan that brought it about. Advaita Charya was singing beautiful verses in glorification of Krishna from one from one particular scripture that Radharani had also sung. And my Lord Chaitanya, hearing that, he went into these ecstasies. And uh, they were dancing and dancing and dancing. And Lord Chaitanya just lost consciousness, fell on the ground, Dwaita Charya picked him up, and then Mukunda started to sing. But after Mukunda started to sing, Lord Chaitanya lost all consciousness like that. So we can appreciate the the glories of pure devotional service when we hear about these these uh, these are the higher stages of bhakti and cannot be cannot be imitated, cannot be really understood. But devotees should understand that the goal of Krishna consciousness is to develop prema pumarta mahan. That is the whole goal of Krishna consciousness, to actually awaken our natural love for Krishna. Anything short is not tolerable for a, for a serious devotee on the practice of Krishna consciousness. Because Unless one achieves love of God, well, achieving is not a, ma a good word. A better word is one reveals their natural love of God through the process of bhakti. Love of God is the treasure of one's existence. It's, it's called gupta. 
Gupta means hidden. When you think of a treasure, treasure, sometimes you think it's something that is also hard to find. Well, that is also true about our love of God. It's hidden within the heart and covered by so many associations of the material energy. But what is the power that breaks through that these coverings? It's Sri Harinam Sankirtan. It's Sri Harinam Sankirtan. And it is association with and service to Vaishnavas. These two things Lord Chaitanya emphasized as the essence of the practice of Krishna consciousness. Associate with devotees, try to serve the devotees as much as you can and please the devotees by your association and offer your love for Krishna. It's easy to offer love to Krishna because love for Krishna is already there in the heart. You just We love so many things, right? What else do we love in this world? We love our... Pizza and chips, right? <laughs> what else we love? We love our new car or my super Mac computer, you know. <laughs> we love so many things that we even love our children, we love our husband and wife sometimes. And we love our you know, we love a lot of things. <laughs> but what is those those loves fall short of perfection because no one can satisfy our thirst for love, only Krishna. Only Krishna can satisfy that unlimited desire for love. And how do you love Krishna? Simply by loving him. <laughs> and Krishna is easy to love because he's lovable. Sometimes we try to love something that's not lovable <laughs> because it's our duty. <laughs> and then we have problems. <laughs> it becomes forced. So, what, But Krishna is naturally lovable. When we hear about his qualities, his names, his pastimes, his his uh, his tra we see his transcendental form when we taste his the prasadam offered to Krishna. Gradually, the love is awakening. So we want more of that. This material world cannot offer anything but death. That is inevitable. <laughs> That's the only thing you can get in this material world is death. Everything else, in between, is leading to that ultimately. But our love for Krishna is the great treasure. And so hearing the glories of the Lord, satam prasangam mamavirya sambhido bhavanti hritkarna rasayana kata. When devotees hear and chant the glories of the Lord, that their love for Krishna, or their attraction for Krishna becomes more and more and more. Because Krishna is all attractive. We heard this philosophy so many times. But the process is continuous hearing. And there's where the the awakening of that natural feeling of attraction for Krishna comes. To hear about Krishna more and more and more. It's like uncovering that great treasure. Radharani, she's with Krishna. And the gopis are there. And uh, they're playing a game. What is that game? It's called hide and seek. How many of you played hide and seek when you were a kid? How many are still playing it? <laughs> Maybe we play hide and seek with our employer, you know, <laughs> or with our spouse. <laughs> Everybody played hide and seek? Is there anybody who didn't? Somehow you missed childhood if you didn't. <laughs> it's a very natural game that kids play. So it started in the spiritual world because it says whatever games that kids play in this world, I mean the ones that are good, started in the spiritual world with Krishna. So Krishna's there, Radharani's there, the gopis are there, and Radharani has to find everyone. So she hides her eyes and everybody goes hiding. And now Radharani's out looking for everyone. And so she's going this way and that way. And there's a problem with the gopis because the gopis can't, remain quiet when Radharani gets close. They have so much attraction for Radharani that when she gets near, they start laughing. <laughs> and then they give their hide away. And then she grabs them. But Krishna's not like that. He's a little bit better. And, you know, he's playing a hard game. So she's trying to catch him. She can't find him anywhere. And every time she gets close, he shifts positions, goes farther away. She's looking everywhere. She's thinking, i got to catch this rascal. 
and she's trying, and then she thinks, oh, I know, I'll use the ultimate weapon. So she starts singing, and what is she singing? The Hare Krishna Maha Mantra so sweetly and so lovingly, and Krishna freezes. He can't move. He tries to move. It's not possible. His mind is frozen, thinking of that beautiful sound that is coming from Radharani's heart. And then she catches him. And she said, I caught you. He says, no, you cheated. He said, she says, no, you're just a bad loser. <laughs> so that's the spiritual world. Everyone is just exchanging loving, loving exchanges in so many different ways. Here, people have to pay for love, right? They want it so bad they're willing to pay for it. How can I learn to love? And somebody writes a book <laughs> and they buy it and they read it. They think if I just can develop this mindset then I can learn how to love or, or I can learn how to give love or I can learn how to receive love. So this world you have to somehow or other you know, create some false situation in order to bring about something. And, but in the spiritual world... To love is natural. It says in the spiritual world, there's three things that constantly go on. It says all singing, and you know, all speech is singing. All walking is dancing. And the constant sound is Krishna's flute. That's That goes on all the time. So everyone, they don't talk, they sing. They don't walk, they dance. <laughs> And Krishna's flu permeates the atmosphere everywhere. Well, this is the spiritual world. So Mahaprabhu is experiencing this and he's, he's showing what are the symptoms. And here it says that, you know, sometimes you want to ignore somebody, but here it shows you how to do it in, a, in an authorized way. <laughs> that if you get so absorbed in ecstasy for Krishna, you know, Hey, I'm talking to you. You're just not there, you know. <laughs> Sometimes devotees do that anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> so yeah, is that the, the the whole world seems to stop when one starts to taste just a slight drop of the happiness of Krishna consciousness, as, as Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says. I'm standing on the shore of the ocean of the devotion of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and I'm simply trying to taste one drop of that unlimited ocean. And then he goes on to say, one drop is enough to drown the whole world. What Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is giving, he's giving the highest. He's giving Krishna in Vrindavan. He's... Krishna, Lord Chaitanya in Kirtan with his associate and Krishna dancing the rasa dance with his intimate, uh, intimate girlfriends, the gopis, is non-different. There's no difference between these two. When you understand that, you can understand what Lord Chaitanya has given us. The highest, the highest form of spiritual Ecstasy is the Rasta dance. And Lord Chaitanya is performing that Rasta dance in the form of Prem Sankirtan. So when he comes to the spirit material world, he doesn't do Kirtan. He does Prem Sankirtan. Prem Kirtan. That Kirtan that is permeated with Bhakti. And all his devotees were like that. So when you can't imagine what Lord Chaitanya's Kirtans were like. So we get a little taste and that taste inspires us to want to keep going in our devotion service so we can surrender our heart and mind and understand what this process of devotional service is. It has nothing to do with anything in this material world, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Yes, do we have a, a roving mic somewhere? No, not to. Eight, oh, eight thirty. Okay, we still got another eleven hours and forty-five minutes.
Why didn't you tell me sooner? <laughs> oh, okay. I guess that means, thank you very much, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Hare Krishna Mahamantra Ki Jai. Hmm.